Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexis Schmicker, and I'm currently a college resident here at Redeemer. So if you are a college student, we would love to meet you if you would come to the Connect table after service in the lobby. Awesome. So today we're going to be in 1 Peter, verses 1 through 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. All right, Alexis, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dusty, and once upon a time, I was one of the pastors here. I've been kind of out of pocket a little bit lately, so if you're newer, you're like, I don't know who you are. Well, people that are around uh, might recognize me from a little ways back, back whenever I used to um, kind of be around on Sundays, I guess. So, hey, glad you're here, and um, this is so much fun of a time of year because we've got a lot, of, a lot of folks that are new, like we're meeting you today, and people are going to come to faith in the next few weeks and months. People are going to get reconnected to Jesus. People are going to get connected to the church. We're going to have uh, people that will be leader, leaders here in both the adult world and the college world, and, and we're never going to even have known you before today, and you're going to be, we're going to wonder how, like, we got along without you in a few months, and I just love every aspect of that. It's so, so much fun. So um, I, I did want to, uh, before we jump into our time in the Bible, um, there's something that was really exciting that happened last Sunday that I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of. So um, this, uh, this is a church that we have, have sent out together with a, another church in, um, in Tucson, Arizona called Doxa Church. I'm not sure how many pictures we got, but you can go and uh, flip through uh, those. This is launch Sunday, and they had 250 people there. Now, there's some well-wishers, including Brandon Gilbert, one of our uh, pastors that, that oversees church planning, was there to celebrate with them. Uh, but such a big deal that um, in a community like that, close to the campus, very similar to Redeemer, want to reach families and adults, but also want to reach college students. And um, that all happened, and that is um, Doxa Church, uh, for the glory of God and the good of Tucson is kind of their, their slogan and all that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to spend just a moment praying for Doxa Church while they, they're having their second Sunday ever today, and want to pray for them, for their reach in that city, for both the depth and the breadth of the ministry. Also pray for our time um, in the Bible today. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for Chris and uh, for what you're doing already there in Tucson uh, through Doxa Church and even that, that really great start and the reach that you've already given them and, and even over the next few weeks with students that that would, um, that would broaden as well. Uh, that you'd bear fruit in um, the, the preaching of your word, sharing of um, good news of hope, um, every aspect of what it means to be uh, disciples that are following you, that, um, that you would bless them in every way. And also, Lord, that you do that for us today, that, um, that you would do uh, beautiful things while we open up your word, while we sing, while we respond, while we take communion, while we connect with people, that um, every aspect of that would uh, draw us just even incrementally closer to you, reflecting you, uh, deep, more deeply attached to you, that your word through the Spirit um, would awaken and cause everything from repentance to encouragement and hope. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to spend just a few weeks to start up our uh, semester in uh, First Peter, handling the first couple of chapters, and um, I, I love this these first couple of chapters, and I'm, I'm going to walk through these first few verses to set um, set a little bit of the tone and the topic here. Um, so if you look at those two verses, the ones that um, that Alexis just read a second ago, that it's really interesting that Peter, that tells you the author right at the beginning, Peter uh, is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and who he's writing to, it's it's really interesting language here. And he says, uh, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. And then he lists a whole lot of places there. Uh, but elect exiles, that's interesting language. And really what he's getting at is he's borrowing language from the Old Testament that in the Old Testament, that whenever, uh, whenever Israel, were, were they're kind of steamrolled by a bunch of foreign powers, um, you know, Persia and Babylon and um, Assyria, there was a whole bunch of them. And, and what would happen on a lot of these defeats is they were taken out of the promised land, out of you know, Israel, and they were, they were dispersed and they were take, taken as exiles. And then they began to be dispersed all over, um, all over the ancient world, even beyond that. I mean, if you, whenever you're reading in the New Testament and you're hearing about, uh, you know, Jews and Gentiles and places in Rome, well, that's the dispersion. And they were dispersed all over the ancient world, really. And, but it's interesting language here that he's saying that, um, that you are elect exiles 
that you're exiles, but not, not one race. These aren't like Jewish people scattered all over the ancient world, but Christians that, uh, that are described as exiles and dispersed. Um, all over the world. And it's interesting because, um, you know, the exile um, is, is saying something, is that, um, that you're, uh, you're not been sent away from like a homeland per se, but it's uh, kind of an interesting way of saying that you have a home in another place, namely heaven. You have a king, you have a kingdom of another place. You belong somewhere else. And you may be citizens of the United States of America or Greece or Japan, or it could be anywhere, uh, but you actually you have another citizenship. You're elect exiles. You've been elect. You are saved by the grace of God. Um, you've been uh, you've been uh, you've been set apart for Him according to the foreknowledge. Verse two, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, which goes along with that word elect um, in the sanctification of the Spirit. So there's a a set apart, um, a a holy making a work of the Holy Spirit. And all of this is for the obedience to Jesus um, and for the sprinkling with his blood. So through the cross, um, you have all, by the way, some people will say, you know, that Christians invented the Trinity, you know, several hundred years you know, after the fact, after the time Jesus was around, I'm like, I don't know, man. That it sure seems like it's there real early on. Um, that you've got, uh, you've got the, uh, you know, the foreknowledge of the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, obedience to Jesus. All three persons of the Trinity mentioned in one verse there. That uh, that what God has been doing, and so what all of this is painting a picture of is it's trying to tell people that are suffering. That's the context. Is people that are suffering pretty mightily for their faith, uh, fairly intense persecution going on for those that would call themselves Christians, that it's, it's framing something here and saying, okay, you're, you're suffering. The reason you're suffering is because you are, you're elect and God is doing all these beautiful things through the cross, but you don't belong here. Like you're, uh, you're not quite at home in the world that we inhabit. A really great quote that highlights this within the first couple of centuries of Christianity. I just saw this within the last couple of weeks. And it says, this is people outside of the Christian faith talking about Christians. And it said, to them, a homeland is a foreign country, and a foreign country is a homeland. Isn't that interesting? So um, we're out of place in the cultures we inhabit, and yet we can make ourselves, we can, we can fit in pretty much anywhere. Like we don't have to belong to like a Christian country that's over here, but in another place, we might not really know how to do it. We can be at home anywhere. We can be dispersed as exiles because our, our deepest attachment is to heaven, but we're also not at home. And this is one of the biggest challenges for me. And we're going to get into this passage here quickly, but um, I'll tell you my biggest challenge. One of my biggest challenges is I often live like I'm making, uh, I'm making a permanent home out of this world. And you'll even hear it in a lot of language that we use about, you know, uh, maybe a young family that's, uh, you're talking to, and they've got a house or an apartment, and they're like, man, we're, we're, tr- we're saving up for our forever home, you know, our forever home we're trying to save up for. And I'm not criticizing you. I've used words like that before too. And it's like, well, I don't know about forever. I mean, maybe, you know, 20, 30 years, maybe we'll see. Then you'll downsize, then the retirement home and all those things. I'm not trying to get morbid here, but I'm just saying, probably not forever, probably not. And, um, but we oftentimes are, are living like, hey, this is gonna go on forever, you know, trying to recreate heaven sometimes in, uh, in a way, uh, maybe some kind of independence, um, maybe, you know, free from commitments, uh, for uh, trying to establish a lot of things that would be, um, you, you're gonna find in heaven, and we try to be very at home, but here's the rub, is that uh, uniquely for Christians, we are never fully at home, ever, you know, ever. And you may feel this in a lot of different ways. You know, one would be we have a totally different value system than the world around us, totally different. Um, you, you will find it all the time. Um, you find it in political discourse. You're going to find it um, in deep values, morality, how we view God, how we view people, how we view things like justice and mercy and all these things. Like you're going to find yourself constantly at odds, how we view money and possessions and career and success constantly a different value system. We are elect exiles. We belong to a different place with a different value system. And you're going you're gonna to feel it. Sometimes you're going to think, no, I really fit in around here. And other times you're like, man, I, no, I've got, a, I've got a totally different orientation of what I think is valuable and worth pursuing. And you're going to feel that. You're going to feel, um, sometimes you may feel even hopeless. I think hopelessness is something that, uh, that a lot of us feel whenever we look around and we see so much brokenness and um, we see the scars that are caused by every Everything from family of origin to uh, people around us and conflict.
conflict and deep wounds that, um, that exist. And you can see that. You can see, um, see pain points. And, um, or for some of us, it may even be just unmet expectations. And we'll get into some of these things as we go. Um, even one last thing I'll say about it, and then we'll just look into the passage for like a, a, an encouraging help with this reality, since that's who we are, our elect exiles that, that um, are not quite at home in the world we inhabit. Um, I, I saw one social commentator was making this point the other day. I was talking about freshmen, and you know, like, and we have, we'll have quite a few freshmen that'll be around today, maybe less so in this service, but there'll be a few of you that are here. Uh, but you know, incredible numbers probably of freshmen in the next two services. And you know, freshman, being a freshman is an awesome time and like really stressful all at the same time because um, it's all out there in front of you. It's so much fun. You're going to meet people, but like it's anxious. You're, you're wondering, like, am I going to meet my people? You know, um, here I am, and I'm, I left this world that I knew, good or bad, but here's this new world, and are people going to, are they going to accept me, or are people going to look at who I am and want me around? Like, if you just want to boil it down to that. And so there's some anxiety, but the social commentator was saying, so that's the life of a freshman. We hope that we can be a part of that solution for you, where you can find a connection here and all that. But um, it was making a case that in a lot of ways, maybe because of social media and other things, that we are all perennially freshmen. You know, 40-year-old single mom is a freshman in some ways that we are, uh, we're trying to fit in all the time and even the things we post, hoping that there will be a kind of an affirmation and acceptance and a belonging. And we're trying to, uh, we're trying to find this, this fit and we just don't, we're just constantly at unease about, uh, do I fit? And do I, am, I, am I accepted here and all this? So that's the context of what kind of people we are when things are unsettled, a chaotic world, uh, that, and you could talk politics, you could talk anything in the world, what kind of people ought we to be? Like, what does grace uh, form us into be? So let's go and jump into the, the solution for uh, all this, and it just jumps right in here in verse 3. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. And so there it is at the very beginning. Mercy is the solution to being, uh, to being not quite at home in the world that you inhabit. Um, he has caused us, uh, that he's the first mover in salvation. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I love this verse. We could spend all morning long on this one verse, is that, that according to his mercy, and that's the bottom line, uh, we're never at Redeemer ever, not only from the pulpit, but hopefully in our gospel communities, hopefully in our relationships, ever going to get tired of grace, ever. Uh, that grace is the best thing ever, according to his great mercy, that he's caused us to be born again. And he's the one that initiated that, uh, that he awakened us. And so there's a, a new life, a new birth, and then you're born again to a living hope. And I love that. And the way that happens is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, from the dead, that the resurrection um, gives us a new birth to living hope. And I think this is really significant because um, I think that hope is something that is in short supply. Like, I think you'll hear a lot of positive talk about things. Uh, we just gotta have you know, faith and we gotta hope that things will be okay. But if you really start pressing people like about real specific things, maybe about a, a particular sin pattern, who knows? And people are like, yeah, I don't think that can change. Or maybe about a relationship, a relationship that is messed up. And uh, where people, it just, you'll, you'll hear people talk and you'll be like, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's ever getting any better. I think it is what it is. How about that marriage? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I think hope is too painful for me to live in there. You know, how about that our world, that there might be a, a great future for our children and grandchildren? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I've seen this world, you know, and on and on. Like there's all these things where we'll have the right answers about things, but we get really cynical, really jaded about God, about people, about ourselves, about all of it. And uh, but this is incredible. What this is saying here is that, okay, yeah, you're, again, this is where we are not real, at real home in the world we're in. It's a messed up place. It's broken. We're broken. Yes, that's the elect exiles part. But uh, God's solution for this is a living hope. And it's not just hope, but it's a living hope. And that's through the resurrection of Jesus because Jesus was made alive uh, because he resurrected from the dead that there's hope for you. Um, in conversation about hope with a couple of staff members, they were uh, quoted the great Ted Lasso, um, that there was this one moment, um, he's got a little inspirational talk to his team in the locker room, and, um, and you know, the kind of cynical people around were saying, you know, it's the hope that'll kill you. You know, it's the thing that gets you. And, you know, don't be, don't be hoping about stuff, because once you start making it, having expectations, those expectations are dashed, and that's the, that's the part that'll kill you. And he said, I disagree. Um, it's the lack of hope that'll get you. And I think, um, I think that Ted's right about that, that the lack of hope where you just, you know, 
quit, uh, quit believing um, that God could do a work in you in the middle of living as an exile, in the middle of this pain and kind of that perennial freshman sense of, am I okay? Do people want me around? Is God, uh, does God want me around? Am I going to make it through this life? And, and the, there's a lot of real broken stuff is that there's living hope, uh, that that's the hopelessness is not the final word. You're actually given something that continues to renew itself because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Verse four, to an inheritance, so you're, uh, you've been born again um, and uh, to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so there's this inheritance that this is what um, one of the things that Peter is going to refer to a lot, not just heaven, but a a lot of heaven is uh, in the middle of suffering, in the middle of feeling like a perennial freshman and feeling like um, you you don't really belong and fit in the world around you, that Peter's going to point and go, well, Here's the thing. I need you to know how all of this goes, where, what, what awaits you. You've got this inheritance um, in our world, and this is what's real difficult about when you're trying to make um, a forever world out of the world we inhabit and have all of your deepest dreams for intimacy, connection, comfort, and peace, and control. You're trying to make all of these things uh, play out right now is that you live in a perishable world, in a defiled world, a fading world. And um, in contrast to this, your inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's beautiful, untainted, and it won't ever grow old. So um, even that new couch that you bought, like brand new, off the floor, it's incredible. You bought it white for some crazy reason, and the kids spilt, um, spilt the sippy cup on it like 20 minutes into having it at the house. Like that thing is going to be sold for $25 on Facebook Marketplace in 10 years. That's, that's where all of that's going. I'm just telling you right now, morbid may it may be. In fact, you, you may even uh, do it cheaper than that just so someone will haul it away because as I've complained about many times, um, Facebook Marketplace makes my head explode. Um, so, um, so there's all of this, and you have this inheritance that's yours, and it's being guarded through faith, and there's a salvation that's ready to be revealed. And how I like to think of this is that ready to be revealed is that it's, it's like God the Father has his hand up. There's an angel army that's been suited up for a couple thousand years with all the angel drip ready to go. I mean, they're game towel, eye black, sleep, whatever. You know, they're, they're completely ready. And all that has to happen for the salvation to become concrete and real is just drop the hand and it's unleashed and it's all made right and wickedness and sadness and brokenness are sent away forever. And that's where all of this is going. And and this is a real encouragement. Can you see how this helps us? If we're right now, when you're in pain, when you don't feel like you fit, that it's all you feel. It's hard to feel any hope and the, like the your experiences around you are saying it's never going to change. And uh, Peter here at the very beginning is saying, actually, it's going to change and it's going to change in a dramatic way. Even if your circumstances never change, which they probably will, but even if they never change as an elect exile, there is coming a day where there's an inheritance that'll never fade. Uh, Nothing ever broken or sad will ever happen again. Verse six, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Various trials, that's pretty broad. Um, It could mean a lot of different things. Uh, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, that's the first time the word tested is used, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I love this, and I hope you can be encouraged by this, especially if you're weary and you've been following Jesus for a long time, um, or maybe it's somewhat new to you, and you just feel like you've been knocked around by life, you know, and you are kind of hopeless about some maybe specific things, maybe uh, maybe even salty towards the Lord, feeling like he's uh, looking to stick it to you at every turn. Who knows? Whatever whatever these things are, it says, look, we, we have the ability to rejoice for a little while, and that's, uh, it doesn't mean that it may go on for 15 minutes. It's just in contrast to eternity, what we just talked about, the imperishable, undefiled thing, that in contrast to that, it's just for a moment, you know, however long, uh, that we may be grieved by various trials. There, there's this, you have the ability to rejoice in the middle of this, um, and by various trials, it can mean everything from, like I think of one of my former college students from back when I was a college director that had a, a husband with a brain tumor that died just this terrible, uh, terrible, painful death. Um, like, and yet the Lord was with her 
while she watched her husband die. And that, that'd be a various trial, like on the far end of the spectrum. It's something that none of us would ever want to go through. Uh, but it's, there's a, a variety of things that are included on this. Uh, being that perennial freshman, um, you know, where you're trying to fit in and you've got some social anxiety, could mean also um, even unmet expectations. Some of you here today may be like, I don't know if I've got any intense suffering, but you know what it was like thinking you're going to be on the varsity team and you, you weren't a starter. You know, um, you thought that, you know, she would like you, but she didn't. And um, you thought you would get into this school, but you didn't. You thought, you thought that it was going to be this next life stage was really going to be really fulfilling when the kids uh, were potty trained. And it was all, it felt like a lot like the current life stage once you got into that one. And you thought if you could just get that next promotion, that everything would be great. And, and you, you know what it's like um, to um, even have these unmet expectations. Various trials is, it's the full gamut of not being at home in this world. It's every part of it. Intense suffering, things that just, even in the greatest moments that you still have this now what element, all of that, um, that through all these things, we're grieved by various trials. But in the middle of that, we have this tested genuineness of our faith and not like God putting you to the test and his arms crossed and being like, well, uh, but more like um, through, um, through these challenges, there's like this refining process. That's the language that's used, like gold, like a refining of gold. It's tested by fire and, And um, here's the thing I want you to know is your faith is beautiful to Jesus. There's this, uh, it it results in praise and glory and honor um, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, um, that there's something beautiful about faith that endures in the middle of all the suffering, in the middle of being an elect exile, in the middle of these various trials, um, in the middle of feeling out of place, in the middle of being grieved. Um, It doesn't mean that it's easy. The word grieved is right there. Of course it's hard. And in the middle of suffering, it can feel like it's the only real thing. You may feel hopeless, uh, but in the middle of this, that there's this enduring faith and it is beautiful to the Lord. I love this. And by the way, I would just say as a quick thing, because I've been talking to Christians a lot. Um, every week we have people that are here that are not Christians that are exploring the faith or maybe just came. Somebody invited you and here you are kind of thing. But... Um, I would even make the case, you know what this is like too. You may not have values like Christians do, like morally, worldview-wise, and it may not feel like you belong to another place, but you know what it's like to be in a world where things just aren't quite right. Uh, I'll say it a lot when I do funerals, that uh, like uh, one thing I'll say, especially when someone's young and dying before their time, um, I'll say sometimes, like, we shouldn't be here. Like, this, just is, this is wrong. Like, we should not be here in this moment. Um, this is out of place. And um, we, we can have things that happen. Anytime you, you say to yourself, this shouldn't be like this, this shouldn't be happening, there should also be a whisper in you of like, okay, so you notice that this isn't how it's supposed to be. There's something in you that knows that something's off. That's a whisper to you of a day where it's made right. Like there's some dissonance in you too. Like you feel it even without the values of the Christian component, you feel that this world is a messed up place and, and that there's something that needs to be made right. It's whispering to you these realities that we're talking about, that there could be something else and not only in heaven, but a reality even now uh, that is pointing towards a time when, when it's made right. Right. Uh, verse 8. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not uh, now see him, you believe in him. And you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Um, I love this too so much. Can you see how this is encouraging people that are getting knocked around by life? It's like, look, I know you don't see him. Right now, the only thing that feels real is the suffering. The only thing that feels real is the anxiety. The only thing that feels real is feeling out of place. It's the only thing you feel uh, sometimes. Um, but it's saying, hey, look, but here's the thing, that uh, you don't see him right now, um, but you believe in him. And there's this joy in you that's inexpressible. It's filled with glory and will result in the outcome of your faith, which is salvation. And I just want to combine this with those previous voices. So here's what I want you to know. Sometimes I think a lot of us feel like God is just constantly dissatisfied with us and that you're going to get through life and um, you're going to you know, appear before the Lord in heaven and you know, his arm's going to be crossed and you know, you're going you're gonna to get there and he's gonna be like, well, it could have been better, you know, not bad, but I've, I've got a few things that I would have liked to have seen out of you. I, a little bit more effort, a little bit of this and this, but here's what I think is going to happen is uh, I'm thinking of someone that had a chronic disease and um, that it just struggled through it. And like it, it didn't necessarily get better. Like they kind of limped through chronic disease and um, they aged that way, and it was just a real challenge. There's a lot of pain almost every day, yet they held on to the Lord in the middle of it. Um, I think of someone that maybe was in a marriage that took a lot of work, 
Um, it was hard. Their deepest uh, desires and fantasies of what marriage might be when they were young, almost none of that played out. Yet, um, before the Lord, they made a commitment before the Lord towards each other. Kenan talked about this last week in Hebrews, that there was this deep commitment to that marriage, and they just kept moving towards the Lord. They kept moving towards each other, even if there were times when it wasn't the most fulfilling relationship um, they ever dreamt of. Uh, people uh, that that had uh, like emotional uh, emotional and mental health challenges, and uh, and yet in the middle of that, sometimes there was some despair. But they they kept coming back to the Lord, and they held on in faith. Here's what I want you to know: is that uh, what this is saying is is that your faith in the middle of that suffering, in the middle of those various trials, in the middle of the unmet expectations, all of that, whatever that means, like you're you're somewhere in that range of like intense suffering, unmet expectations, feeling kind of out of place in the world, is that this is beautiful to Jesus. Like when he sees you, um, it's saying here that in that verse, in verse seven, that it'll result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And um, that there's gonna be a, a inexpressible and glory filled joy and even a salvation of soul. Like what I think is gonna happen is, is that you're gonna see Jesus wipe away the tears from your face, from that chronic pain and those unmet expectations and the loss and the grief and the suffering that you experienced from those various trials. And then you're gonna get a hug and then he's gonna say, well done. That was beautiful to me. Beautiful, beautiful. And were you a sinner for sure? Did you waver on that? Sometimes, did sometimes you get kind of salty about it? Did sometimes you, you despair? Did sometimes you lose hope? Sure, uh, but in the middle of that, the faith remained and it is beautiful to the Lord that brought glory and honor to him that probably nothing glorifies God quite as much it's probably less at the Super Bowl where you hold the trophy up and you're like, thank you, Jesus, like Kurt Warner did a long time ago. That's great. Yeah, and the wins, let's do that. Uh, but sometimes uh, with tears where we hope in God, a living hope because of the resurrection brings more glory to God than anything I can think of. Last few verses, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. So this is talking about the Old Testament, talking about the era that we live in now, this grace that we experience. Uh, they searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which the angels long to look. So so um, all this is saying that, look, even in just as one final exclamation point on this hope that he's given us in the middle of various trials that we're experiencing while we feel like we're not at home, is that the whole Old Testament, if you're like, yeah, I don't really know the Bible real well, is that the whole Old Testament was anticipating this, this one great story of redemption, and that the prophets were, were trying to even grasp, like, what kind of time and place and what kind of, what would it be like when the Messiah comes? And, and they, they were curious about this. Like, they, they spoke dimly of the hope that we have seen clearly now. And even the angels, the angels in heaven are like kind of looking over, over the edge of heaven, if you want to think about it like this, and going, man, no way, no way, no way that this is happening. Like, they are, there's something incredible that we get to experience as human beings that have been redeemed by grace, that everything in the Old Testament was looking curiously towards. And even now, as the kingdom of God unfolds, um, angels are just so curious on how the kingdom moves forward and how the grace of God through Jesus works in us um, that they just long to look into. And, um, and even Jesus' suffering, that he understands your pain. Uh, we learned this through Hebrews this summer when we went through it, while we worked through that book, that that he suffered like we do, and that should be even a final encouragement. While we, yes, heaven, uh, but even now, like we belong to him, and he understands, and he sympathizes with what you're going through, a broad range of various trials. So here's the thing. Um, one way to read this today is to be like, man, heaven's gonna fix it all, um, and yes, for sure. That is a powerful weapon when you feel hopeless is there is coming a time when it's gonna be made right. Um, there will be a, a point when every deep longing you've ever had for intimacy, connection, joy, purpose, deep soul satisfaction, um, even the relief of pain, it's all gonna be met fully and with more depth than you can imagine. I mean, it's gonna be amazing. So that, that part is true. But um, I do think that there's something else here that in the middle of not quite fitting, that um, there's something powerful about what um, God's trying to do through Peter here, a reframing of your current experience of when you don't feel like you really fit right now, he's saying, exactly, 
Exactly. Like you're not, you're trying to make a home right now, trying to make permanence out of something that was never intended to be. Like this could never carry the weight of your expectations for comfort, for belonging, for intimacy. It can never do that for rest, uh, for peace. This world can never, ever deliver on this. And, um, and when, once we adjust our expectations, be like, oh, God can. And that's actually what I'll enjoy in heaven too. I can begin to put my weight of those expectations and the frustration of that pain in him. It would be like this. It'd be like uh, a parent that has a kid that's went way off the rails, like homeless, um, living on the streets, in great danger all the time. You know, one thing you could do, and I mean, this would be fine. You could. These will all be true things. You could say, hey, look, you're causing mom and dad, your siblings, a lot of pain. Cut that out. Um, you know, it's dangerous out here. Um, you're, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of problems if you persist in this. You know, you're damaging your career. You're all these things, whatever. I mean, you could do, you could say all those things. And I would say that the Bible would, you know, come alongside some of those things. They'd be true. All those things would be true. All right. Um, but what, uh, but it's interesting that what Peter is doing here, it'd be like, to use that analogy, it'd be like the parent that, if you used the way Peter's approaching it, would approach that same kid. And instead say, hey, look, I need you to know where you belong. I need you to know where you belong. You don't belong on the street. You don't belong there. You belong in our home with me, your mother, your brothers, your sisters. It's safe. We have good food. You don't have to worry about any risk. You don't have to worry about any danger. You share our last name. You belong to us. Like You, you don't belong there. Uh, you belong with us, and you have a home, and uh, you, have a new, you have this identity, and you don't have to scrounge for food. Uh, we will provide for you. You don't fit there. You fit here, and uh, that, that's the encouragement that's being given to us is, look, you, you're in this world, but you belong with God. So here's the thing. My encouragement today would be um, that it, some of us have lost hope and um, you're almost afraid to hope that God can transform, God can heal uh, because there's pain and some of the pain of some of those unmet expectations from the past. Uh, but we've been born again to a living hope. And the major trump card in all of this, that ace of spades that's thrown down right on the top of that stack is that Christ has been resurrected from the dead. And that's something that will transform a life and give us hope in the middle of all kinds of challenging things. Let me pray. Lord, would you uh, give us hope in the middle of whatever it is that various trials that are going on in this room, social anxiety, new starts, um, new town, um, new school, um, or just pain, loss, bereavement, suffering, that, um, that you, would give, um, you would give grace for all of that experience and more, even new life, new salvation uh, for some, uh, but even hope, hope in, um, hope in you. Lord, let that be, and I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.